He set the needle down gently on the black grooved circle and closed the glass top. A crackling hiss came from the speaker system, followed by Beethoven's fifth. Ah, he said as he poured a glass of wine and sat in his reclining chair. My favorite. For the next hour, side A of the record played as the man sank deeper into his chair reminiscing about the week's events and hoping that side B was just as warm as he remembered it all those years ago. Earlier that day, he had found himself in a tiny mom-and-pop record shop in northern Seattle, just poking around looking for gems, as was his Friday custom. He was looking in the classical section when he came across the record now playing on his stereo system, Oh, how he had loved this record as a young boy, some 40-plus years ago. He carefully took the record out of its sleeve and examined it, followed by the sleeve and saw the mark. Yes, this was it. This was the record he had given away by accident all those years ago. He hugged it close to his chest and proceeded to the checkout line, paid the teenage cashier with two crisp $20 bills, and went home. His thoughts broke as side A ended. He got up slowly, clutching his lower back and stretching as he walked across the now dark room to the record player. With trembling hands full of excitement and fear, he opened the glass on the player, gently removed the record, and flipped it to side B. The man then gently set the record down on the player and lowered the needle to the fourth black roof, closed the glass top, and sat back in his chair as that familiar crackling hiss came from the speakers. Muffled screams emanated from the speakers this time, along with a second voice. Now, now, calm down. I don't want to hurt you. I just want to have a little fun, said the calm comforting male voice. A muffled shriek followed by cries of pain echoed from the speakers and through the house. Shh. It's just a little fire. Nothing to worry about. As the screams and shrieks continued, the man eased back into his chair, sipped his wine, and smiled. Many view personality traits as concepts rather than visible, tangible objects. I see things differently. When I entered secondary school, I was startled at first to see people around me morph into abominations of form and color that would easily startle anyone else that could see them. However, after exploring the social environment of the school a bit more, I learned that certain physical traits were manifestations of mental characteristics. For example, someone who is frugal would have pikes of lustrous gold and silver protruding from their back. Someone who is narcissistic may have their own face represented on multiple areas of their body. Everyone had multiple noticeable features, and the combinations of certain characteristics could lead to some nearly inconceivable sights. I was happy with my gift, and it was decently amusing, most of the time anyway. Today we had a new substitute chemistry teacher to fill in for our old one, he wasn't exactly a top-of-the-line guy. He had a bit of a twitch, and he was clearly in a state of constant distress. However, what stunned me the most 
was the fact that he looked like an actual human being. No fiery hair or dorsal fins or anything of the like. I was ecstatic to finally see an actual person until I caught a glimpse of this singular trait. A faint, shadowy limb protruded from his left shoulder, pulsating with fumes of smoke and hellfire. In its hand was a standard digital clock. Bright red digits shined brilliantly in the dark background. It was counting down. Cradling my four-year-old daughter in my arms, all I could do was listen as the screaming outside got louder and louder interspersed with sounds of violence and horrible, horrible wet thuds and the unmistakable echo of muscle and sinew resisting the force that was slowly tearing them apart. It started just three days ago. Something happened out there in the world and before we even got news of what was going on, seemingly half of the world was gone police and military were unable to stop it, providing such a short frame of resistance. It's hard to know whether it was real or just a fluke. There was no centralized target, no way to use our most powerful weapons, not without incinerating ourselves in the process. They poured forth across the world from wherever it was that it started. I hear banging on the door downstairs, and the screams of people being slaughtered, unable to mount a proper resistance against such a force. It doesn't take long before the pounding gives way to a splintering and the sound of shattering wood. They're in the house. No more than a moment or two passes before the door to the bedroom starts shuddering. The things I piled against it are holding it for now, but I know, realistically, that they're going to manage to come through. I keep rocking my little girl, humming a lullaby in her ear to calm her as she cries. The pounding grows in force and volume, the frame starting to crack. I put my little girl on my lap, her back to my chest, and I stroke her head with both hands, from the top of her scalp down across her ears, just as I've done ever since she was a baby, just the way she loves it. The effect is instantaneous. Her desperate crying calms to a series of sobs and hiccups her small body shuddering against mine in fear. I keep humming to her, soothing her hair, acting for all the world as if nothing is out of place, not a single thing amiss. Agonizingly slowly, in a reverse cadence of the sound of splintering wood, she calms down. I can feel it when she stops tensing, as I keep stroking her down the sides of her head. A final sob and she falls quiet, her body relaxed. She doesn't even have time to realize what's happening as I twist her neck with a violent jerk, accompanied by a dry snap of a sound. She's dead before she can even slump down onto my lap. The door is giving way, the furniture pushed back and I may be torn from limb to limb while I scream. But at least now, my baby is safe from it. They perfected a chip that when implanted in your brain would allow you to read the thoughts of others. 
At first, everyone was excited, and they all clamored eagerly to get the first view. As soon as they were proven unreliable, anyone who could afford one bought one. At first, it seemed perfect. Murderers and criminals were caught easily, and you could judge how a relationship could go on a first date. But we're all human. We think things we don't mean during arguments and fights. And so the chip began to cause strains and rifts between family and friends. Then there was a petition to get the chips removed, which was successful. Unfortunately, their brains had been altered by the chip. They couldn't stop hearing people's thoughts. Online support groups popped up, and scientists everywhere began researching ways to reverse the effect. It turns out that some random person on Reddit had the answer. Circular reasoning, maybe, but his solution worked. If you think about what is doing your thinking, you stop hearing other people's thoughts. I was always poor and I could never afford the chip. But what I have learned is that if you spend all your time thinking about your brain, your own brain isn't enough. I can hear them moaning and shuffling outside my door right now, desperate for mine. I've known that I was infected since before the scientists even announced the discovery of the parasite. It worked its way into people's heads, they said, filling them with all sorts of disgusting desires and horrifying thoughts. Over a third of the population was believed to be infected, they said, and I alone breathed a sigh of relief. I wasn't the only one. For over a year, this thing's been lodged inside my head. I've been subjected to its effects for so long, I can barely remember what it was like to be normal. It started with anger. I know that much. A burning, churning rage that clawed through my belly and set my nerves on fire. I think I hurt someone. I think I might have hurt a lot of someone's, actually, very badly. But it isn't my fault. That's what the people on the news keep stressing. It isn't the fault of the infected, and we shouldn't blame ourselves. Most importantly, people shouldn't try to take revenge on us. We're the victims here. I'm finally going to be free, I think to myself, and to the parasite, gleefully. No more disgusting images, no more monstrous desires. No more sick thoughts every hour of every day. Before it was impossible to see a doctor and get myself diagnosed, even though I knew I had it. But now that the government's finally got their shit together, the testing is mandatory. I'm waiting in line at the clinic now. It's almost my turn to have my finger pricked and my blood analyzed for the telltale pheromones the parasite leaves in its wake. Soon they'll read a positive result, and I'll finally receive the treatment I need. Soon I'll be cured. Clear, calls the tester, and waves the next patient forward, a fidgety old woman. He pricks her thumb and hums as the machine processes a sample, and then frowns. Infected, he yells, and nurses usher the woman away through a set of swinging doors. I crane my neck to get a glimpse of what's back there. Any minute now, that'll be me. Clear. Two people left. Clear. One person left. Clear. I step up to the desk, grinning widely, 
Even though the horrible whining voice of the parasite is telling me to smash his stupid face into the desk right there in front of everyone, it's getting desperate. Not long now, you horrible little bastard. I present my thumb proudly. The sting of the needle feels like victory and I inhale deeply as the machine whirs. Clear. Clear.